Good afternoon, viewers. On today's Angry Bulletin, we are going to be revisiting a ship that I touched on briefly about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I believe, the Ensman Pulse class starship. Now, many of you are thinking that I have used another clickbait title or whatever you want to call it by talking about a ship that's 10 times the size of Elon Musk's starship and something that is capable of traveling traveling from Earth to Mars 8,000 times as fast. That may seem ridiculous and impossible, but if you're not really familiar with just how much faster relativistic speed is compared to the chemical rockets that we have today, well, you're about to find out right now. So before we start talking about the crazy brainchild of Dr. Robert Duncan Ensman, we need to talk about the propulsion system that inspired it. And some of you may recognize this. It's the Orion-class nuclear starship. Now, just to be clear, this may kind of look like a modified Saturn V to you, and that is indeed exactly what it is. And by the way, if you want to check out this clip in its entirety, well, you need to go over to Hayes Gray Art and check out his incredible work. And by the way, the audio on this clip is absolutely astonishing, so don't miss it. In any event, the idea is to utilize the first stage of a Saturn V rocket in order to drive the rest of the ship safely into orbit, where it can start using nuclear bombs to provide its propulsion. The idea is to jettison tiny thermonuclear bombs with an explosive yield of only a fraction of a kiloton. The maximum that this can actually generate is about 0.35 kilotons, and the bombs are shaped in such a way to create directed plasma that transfers its energy to a metallic plate attached to shock absorbers that are attached to the ship. Therefore, the energy of the thermonuclear blast Last is transferred to the ship, providing a tremendous amount of thrust. Well, how tremendous? Well, a ship like this, if it were to launch from ground level, and yes, in theory it could if you don't care about little nuclear explosions on the launch pad, it could carry up to 61 hundred tons worth of payload up to low Earth orbit. <laughs> An absolutely insane amount of payload, but it could also deliver as much as 5,700 metric tons all the way to the moon. But of course, the most amazing thing about an Orion starship is the fact that it can achieve speeds as high as 10% of the speed of light. And we definitely have the technology now to build something like this. We actually had this technology as far as 70 years ago. So what's crazier than using nuclear bombs to propel you to a percentage of the speed of light? Well, how about... 600 meter long ship weighing millions of tons propelled by eight of these Orion engines. For most of his life, Dr. Ensman had a dream of interstellar exploration and colonization. He was quick to point out just how many stars lie within a relatively close striking distance of our own planet. Within a 10 light year distance, or 3 parsecs, there are 12 stars. Within 5.5 parsecs, or 18 light years, 96 stars. 11 parsecs, 600 and 64 stars. 15 parsecs, roughly 1,600 stars, and that's by our best estimates. 31 parsecs, 16,000 stars, and if you go all the way out to 1,000 light years away, or 310 parsecs, 6 million stars. And 1,000 light years, by the way, is 1% of the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy. So yes, an incredible number of destinations and the potential of building a vast interstellar empire very close to our own sun. But how do we get there? 
Well, obviously, getting to a destination that is several light years away or even a thousand light years is going to require a ship that can travel a substantial percentage of the speed of light or a generation ship capable of holding many generations of colonists and whose grandchildren or great-grandchildren may live to see their destination, but the rest will not. The Pulse-class starship is a bit of both. A ship that, in theory, might be able to travel at least a substantial percentage of the speed of light, but still so slow that we need to look at generations living on board this ship, gradually contributing towards a larger population before the destination is finally reached. Because even with eight of these Orion-class engines detonating quite a number of nuclear blasts behind the ship or actually semi-contained in the engines behind the ship, you're not going to get a velocity that's much higher than 10% of the speed of light, although depending on the efficiency of the engines themselves and how efficiently they use their fuel, you might be able to get up to about 30% of the speed of light, but definitely no faster. Now, in order to get a ship this size up to relativistic speeds, you need a hell of a lot of fuel, anywhere from 3 to 12 million tons of frozen deuterium. So the Pulse-class starship is essentially a flying iceberg, with virtually all of the fuel being contained in the large sphere at the front of the ship. Deuterium being fused together to form helium, the most efficient type of thermonuclear reaction, so this this is essentially a fusion starship, but the difference is you're not actually trying to produce power with the fusion reaction, nor are you trying to control the explosions. An article in the 1977 Starlog magazine described the system this way, quote, the nuclear pulse engines used in the Ensman starship differ from that suggested in the Orion. The flying iceberg has eight units, each containing the entire explosive energy of a nuclear blast inside a gargantuan chamber and venting the force afterwards. With this more efficient system, Ensman believes his ship could reach a peak velocity of 30% of the speed of light. But this is much more than just a flying iceberg with big nuclear engines. This is a ship designed to travel between the stars and to carry colonists there lots of colonists. And given the fact that even at 30% of the speed of light, you're still looking at a considerable amount of time passing over a decade to reach the closest star and much longer to reach other destinations, you need a substantial amount of space for your passengers. Actually, a self-contained world of sorts. So let's take a quick tour of the ship. First of all, obviously, you have the massive fuel tank at the front, about 300 meters in diameter, and this serves not only to contain millions of tons of deuterium, but it also serves to shield the rest of the ship from radiation and other particles traveling at 10% or 30% of the speed of light. Pretty useful, actually, to have this additional protection, although I fail to understand what's going to happen when you have to slow down, because you turn the ship around and apply thrust in the opposite direction, meaning you no longer have your fuel tank defense, unless you were to add a fuel tank at either end of the ship. Ensman never really dealt with that particular issue. But let's have a look at the rest of the vessel. We're talking about a vast world ship, as I suggested, divided into multiple rotating modular habitats that could actually be transferred from one starship to another in a vast colonization fleet. Each habitat would be divided into 20 decks with over 100 rooms per level a lot of them for habitation, but also you would have gardens and parks and hospitals and laboratory areas, essentially a self-contained city flying through space. And once again, you would absolutely need this if you had an extensive journey ahead of you, especially if you're only traveling at about 10% of the speed of light, even getting it to Alpha Centauri would require nearly half a century. That being the case then, 
this is a very good design for a generation ship in my opinion even at 30 percent of the speed of light the transition time is going to be very very significant now each of these habitation units are about 91 meters in length and 91 meters in diameter and the ship has three of them comprising the entire vehicle and they are modular meaning that if one of them is damaged they can be jettisoned or swapped out with other ships in the fleet as I suggested before. In addition to that they rotate in order to provide artificial gravity at a speed of about four revolutions per minute in order to generate an artificial gravity roughly the equivalent of what we have here on earth meaning that these multiple generations would not lose any of their physical capabilities by the time they arrived at their destination at a distant star regardless of how long it might take and a lot of engineers have had a look at this concept and there are a number of issues really don't feel that this type of propulsion system, the exploding fusion bombs, are going to be able to produce a velocity much greater than what Orion was originally intended to do, about 9 to 10% of the speed of light. Of course, you're pushing a much, much bigger payload. Let's go ahead and compare what the Pulse Starship is capable of doing compared to some of the other popular interstellar designs. This is Project Daedalus, a multi-stage fusion-powered ship that uses deuterium and helium-3 fusion in order to provide the necessary energy for propulsion, and it can achieve a slightly higher speed of about 12.2% of the speed of light, 36,600 kilometers per second. However, it's much, much smaller than Ensman's concept. In fact, Every damn thing is smaller than Ensman's concept. Look at how colossal this ship is compared to just about any other ship that anybody's ever thought of. If you really want to talk about a generation ship that's capable of carrying as many as 2,000 people in relative comfort in an environment that they really would never want to leave because after all, many of the crew are never going to leave this ship, well, Ensman's design, regardless of speed or viability, still is a very, very good solution. And where are you going to get all this deuterium? Well, deuterium is found in water, actually. It's a fairly common thing here on Earth, but also you could find loads of deuterium in the gas giants, especially Saturn. And there is another thing to consider when we're talking about any type of interstellar ship. Even though 9 or 10 percent of the speed of light may not sound all that sexy for interstellar travel if you compare it to warp speed or something like that, consider the fact that at 10 percent of the speed of light it would take you 30 minutes to get from Earth to Mars as opposed to six months with Starship. Therefore, that's why I made the claim that I did. 30 minutes is 8,000 times faster, actually more than 8,000 times faster than six months. And there are much faster ships that Ensman designed, such as the Echo Lance, and I have a couple of videos covering that particular spacecraft if you haven't seen that yet, linked at the end of this video. But the most important thing to remember about the Pulse, or Orion for that matter, is in spite of the enormous scale in the enormous amount of money that would be required to build something like this, the technology is present day. There is nothing that we don't understand, nothing that we can't build contained in this spacecraft. We could, if we really wanted to invest the time, money, and effort, build a spacecraft like the Pulse now. And Dr. Ensman, for most of his life, maintained that exploring the stars was mankind's destiny, and delaying it for the sake of saving a little bit of money 
or invading a country like Afghanistan simply isn't worth it. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and also please consider supporting this channel on Patreon because I've just released another exclusive video on my Patreon channel about China's ambitions in space. So I've got at least five videos at last count in my uh, library for Patreon supporters. And also you can make suggestions as to what types of videos you would like me to make next. And in addition to that, please don't forget to support the work of Nick Stevens. Most of his animations you've been watching during the course of this video and also on the Ensman Archive fascinating uh, website and also YouTube channel that's releasing new information about Ensman's interstellar ideas all the time. Just such fascinating information. Make sure not to miss that. And also please support the work of Hayes Gray Art as well. Thanks again for watching and as always, stay angry about space.